All right, good morning. We are going through uh, study number four, and let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of having Sunday school today. We praise you as the righteous, the glorious, the sovereign, the majestic God, the God of love and grace, of loving kindness and faithfulness, faithfulness to your people, to spare them, faithfulness to judge and separate the, the wicked from your saints out of your love for your saints. We pray that you would help us, give us doors of utterance for the gospel. Um, please bless our Sunday school class, the other classes here, as we continue to go through this series of evangelistic Bible studies. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, so as you remember, study number four, we're going through 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which explains what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We're on page... Four, and we're looking at the person of the gospel, Christ. So, who is the one who died for our sins? It was Christ who died for our sins, and was buried and rose again. We saw in John fourteen six, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. And since Christ makes that statement that he's the way, the truth, and the life, we said there were three, there's an argument that involves, for, again, for people who say Jesus is just a good man, and the argument involves three L's. Remember what the three L's are? Of uh, Two of them are not what he is, and the one is what he is. Since Christ says he's the only way to the Father, he cannot be a, let me be the first one, a liar, lunatic, lunatic or, or what's the third option? Lord. Lord, yeah, liar, lunatic, or Lord, and Lord is the correct one. We'll deal with legend, which is another possibility a bit later. But, so you could say it's liar, lunatic, legend, or Lord. But at this point, we're saying liar, lunatic, or Lord. And so, Lord is the best option there. So, Christ makes that claim. And we then um, saw that he's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he has an everlasting love for his people. And we're in Proverbs chapter 8 here. So, you can go to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. So God gave those who he foreknew, um, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, he gave them as a gift to his Son, and the Son determined to save them, to die for them, redeem them, and the Spirit determined to draw them to Christ and give them repentance and faith. That's the, uh, we can see that in John 17, we saw that last time, the Bible teaches that. So now in Proverbs chapter 8, we have wisdom crying here and wisdom is um, you know, somebody could say well this is just an attribute of God but it looks like it's kind of personalized here so um, Christ is called the wisdom of God and the power of God in 1 Corinthians 1 24 and there's definite parallels here to John chapter 1 now notice in Proverbs 8 in verse 22 and following, we're not going to exposit this whole thing right now, but in verse 22, wisdom is speaking, and wisdom says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundation to the earth. Notice this is one long sentence. When, 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 when. Okay? And then we have the conclusion here. Then I was by him <coughs> as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. So here, God's eternal wisdom, and of course, God was always wise, and so he always had his wisdom with him. And so Christ here is the wisdom of God, was uh, Jehovah's possession in verse 22, even from everlasting. Uh, the Watchtower Society tries to claim that this passage teaches that Christ was created out of nothing. But that's simply not the case. Uh, God always had his wisdom. He was never not wise. So that isn't a very good argument. 
And uh, it doesn't say in verse 22 that he was created. It says he was possessed. Uh, he belonged to the Father, and the Father belonged to him. Uh, and he said he was from everlasting in verse 23. Uh, so, and then when it says he was brought forth in verses 24 and 25, those are begetting terms, and the Son is, of course, eternally begotten of the Father. God of God, God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, one essence with the Father. And so he was eternally of the Father, begotten of the Father, and talks about how he was there even before creation in all the following verses. Now in verse 30 and 31, notice it says that the Son was daily the delight of the Father, rejoicing always before him. So the Father and the Son were rejoicing one and the other. The Son was rejoicing always before the Father. So he, what, there wasn't some kind of, uh, the Godhead isn't this, uh, gl God isn't gloomy and kind of dour and, and there's eternal rejoicing. The Father rejoicing in the Son, the Son rejoicing in the Father, or God is a God of rejoicing. So it makes sense that the Father and the Son would rejoice in each other, but then look at verse 31. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. But now here, this is even before creation from the previous verses. So even before the creation of the world, the Father and the Son were delighting and rejoicing in those whom Christ would save. What a blessing. So if you're redeemed, Christ was rejoicing in you. You here in El Sobrante, you know, dust and ashes, he was rejoicing in you before the foundation of the world. Now that is a wonderful thing. That will cheer you up if you're having a bad day that the Father and the Son were rejoicing and delighting in you before the foundation of the world. So uh, we can see the everlasting love that God has, the true God has for his people in this passage. So as the Son has from eternity been the boundless delight of the Father, so he has eternally rejoiced in the salvation of those the Father gave him. Having had in his heart from eternity past the, to, the plan to save men, the Son appeared to his people in various ways in the Old Testament. So John 1 and verse 18 says, John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. And contextually, that's God the Father. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So right after that, it talks about the Father right after that. So when it says no one has ever seen God, uh, it's not saying no one's ever seen Christ. It's not saying no one's ever, well, no one has seen, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a bodily form. But no one's ever seen the Father. That's the point of John 1.18. Instead, the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. So he has this, this very close, intimate relationship with the Father, even as uh, someone who's in his bosom, who is, he's holding him to his heart here in the metaphor. Of course, the Father doesn't have a body, a literal body with a bosom, but we, it's expression of the, the closeness, the intimacy of the Father and the Son. So the Son, from this intimate position of closeness to the Father, has declared or revealed him. So the Son, because he is uh, fully God, one with the Father, can fully declare and fully reveal the Father. So no one's ever seen the Father, but the Father has granted that all revelation to us comes through the Son. So in the Old Testament, are there texts where people saw God? Yes, there are. I think we... We just were kind of getting to this last time. So uh, Genesis 32, 30, Jacob says, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So he was wrestling with this person in Genesis 32. And he says, after wrestling with him all night, that he's seen God face to face. But no one's ever seen the father. So who is this? If he's seen God face to face and no one's ever seen the father. In Exodus 24 and verse 10, the leaders of Israel say that they saw the God of Israel. So if they saw the God of Israel, but no one's ever seen the Father, who did they see? And then in Joshua, I think we ended with, with Joshua last time, right? Yeah? Yeah, so Joshua sees this guy with a sword. Joshua says, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. You're for me, I'm <laughs> not for you. Oh, okay. Joshua falls down and worships, says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And uh, the, the person here with a sword in his hand says, take your shoe off your foot, like in Exodus 3. Take your sandal off. You're on holy ground. I'm the God of the burning bush, basically. I'm the one who appeared, the Jehovah of the burning bush. And so he does that. And then in Joshua 6, 2, Jehovah speaks and gives the orders for how to take the city. And who is Jehovah speaking in Joshua 6, 2? It's the captain of the host of the Lord, 5, 13 to 15. 
<coughs> so here Joshua saw Jehovah, but no one's ever seen the Father. So who were these people seeing? They were seeing the Son. Why was it appro- It was very appropriate for the Son to be the one who a- appeared in temporary... He didn't have a body back then, of course, because he only became man in the Incarnation. But it was appropriate for the Son to be the one who visibly appeared to people because he was going to be the one who had permanently become man. Okay? So it was very appropriate. It would have been confusing if the Father had appeared in a body or the Holy Spirit had appeared in a body when it was the Son who was going to become incarnate. Okay? So it's, but it's very appropriate for the Son to temporarily uh, put these physical forms on as a kind of um, ahead of time pointing forward to his permanently becoming man. So this was God's plan. So we see that. Now, in... John 12, 36 to 41, here's another very explicit text. Look at John 12. This is a passage that I actually like to use with anti-Trinitarians like the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's False Witnesses. Uh, And this is because they have certain, typically a Watchtower Society person does not know the Bible. He doesn't know how to study the Bible. He doesn't, he's never done a word study in his life. Like he's never looked up all the uses of the word mighty God to see if it really is some kind of lesser deity in Isaiah 9, 6, or if mighty God is a title for Jehovah. So he doesn't know how to study the Bible, but he has certain proof texts. So for them, Bible study is looking at the Watchtower magazine and seeing what the magazine says. Okay? Kind of like, you know, for a Catholic, they don't probably study the Bible, but if they do, they just see what the church fathers say or what, what the priest says, and then whatever that says, that's, that's Bible study. Okay? So uh, they don't really know the Bible. And, and this is a passage they don't typically deal with in their literature, so they won't know what to say. They'll have to actually look at the passage instead of having their set little response that they've got out of the magazine. Okay? So John 12, 36 to 41. So, and then we're going to look at this, what this is quoting. So John 12, so verse 36, Christ is speaking, and he says, While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So Christ was speaking in John 12. But though he had done so many miracles before them. Now he is a pronoun. Who is he referring? He in verse 37 is referring to what in verse 36? Jesus, yeah. The pronouns go back to a noun. Okay, They're in favor of nouns. They're pro-noun. Okay? And we're pro-life. We're in favor of life. So, uh, so he, Jesus is the one in verse 37. Though Jesus had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Who did they not believe on? They didn't believe on Jesus. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And I think I mentioned this before, but why in the Old Testament does it say Isaiah, and here in the New Testament says Esaias? What, why? I mean, did they just not know how to spell it right? Um, because the King James is very literal, it's reproducing in the New Testament. If the names look slightly different than the Old Testament, it's because in the New Testament, it's reproducing the Greek spelling. Just like in the Old Testament, it's reproducing the Hebrew spelling. Kind of like with the name Jesus. Jesus is English. In Spanish, you say Jesus. Okay? Um, so, or actually, the Old Testament name is Joshua. Yahashua is the same name as Jesus. So, same name. Yahashua, Jesus. If you have a Greek Old Testament, it's called the Book of Jesus. Uh, is the book of Joshua. It's the book of Jesus. Okay? And it is interesting that Joshua was able to enter, lead the people in the promised land, and Moses could not. Moses broke the law. He failed. But Joshua, Jesus, led them into the promised land. So, uh, but in any case, so the reason there's that slight difference in the name is because it's very literal, and it's giving you the Greek way of saying Isaiah. So in Greek, you'd say Isaiah. In Hebrew, you'd say Isaiah. It's the same name. So that's why. If you've ever wondered why, it's a slightly different, you know, whatever. Okay, so that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? So these Jews did not believe on Jesus, and this was fulfilling what Isaiah said about Jesus. So there in verse 38, he's quoting Isaiah 53 in verse 1. So Isaiah 53, 1, we're not going to look at that one right now, but it's the servant song uh, about the suffering servant, the Messiah. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. They should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. 
That's Isaiah 6.10, verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Now, through this whole passage, who is the he? Is it the Father? Or is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it the Pope? Is it Buddha? Who's the he in this passage? All the way through, it's Jesus. So, verse 41, Isaiah said the previous verses when he saw Jesus' glory and spake of Jesus. Right? And if you talk to a watchtower, sir, and say, I, I'd like to, could you help me understand this passage here? I'd like to t- see what you think about this passage. Oh, yes, I'd love to help you understand this passage. So you go through there, and so, and he'll agree with you. So, so Isaiah said these things when he saw Jesus' glory and speak of Jesus. Yep, that's right. Isaiah said these things when he saw Jesus' glory and speak of Jesus. That's right. That's what it says. He'll agree with you. Well, because that's what it's saying. So this is good. So he agrees that this, Isaiah said these things when he saw Jesus. Yep. Okay. Now, verse 40 is quoting Isaiah 6 and verse 10. So let's go to Isaiah 6 and verse 10. Isaiah 6, 10. It's right after Isaiah 6, 9, right before Isaiah 6, 11. So Isaiah 6, 10. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So Isaiah said this when he saw Jesus' glory. That's what the Apostle John says, right? Yep, Isaiah said this when he saw Jesus' glory and spake of Jesus. Yep, that's right. Okay. So whose glory is seen in Isaiah chapter 6? Now often a watchtower person will actually agree with you up to this point. If he knows Isaiah 6, he might be a little nervous though. But typically they'll agree because they don't really know the Bible very well. So Isaiah said, Isaiah 6.10, when he saw Jesus' glory and spake of Jesus, according to the Apostle John and John 12. So whose glory is in Isaiah 6? Well, let's take a look. Start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. (coughs) Train is the the cloak of his garment, not like choo-choo train, okay? Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Ooh, so whose glory is seen in Isaiah 6? Jehovah. This is Jehovah. But no one's ever seen the Father. And John, under inspiration, said this is Jesus. So when Isaiah sees Jehovah's glory in Isaiah chapter 6, and you can keep going all all the way down to verse 9 and 10, Jehovah is the one speaking. Well, let's just read it down to verse 9. So, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, So through something that represents the sacrificial death of Christ, he's cleansed. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who shall go, will go for us? So here the Lord refers to himself as an us. Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And then we have Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 quoted in John 12. So clearly, Isaiah saw Jehovah's glory. Jehovah is referred to as an us in verse 8 because the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So um, this is the glory of the Father because the glory of the Son is the glory of the Father. And actually, Acts 28, 25 to 27 says it's the Holy Spirit who said this. So John says it's, it's Christ. Acts 8, 28 says it's the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. But in any case, this is a very clear evidence that according to the Apostle John, Jesus is the one who is sitting on this throne who's Jehovah. And when you start going through Isaiah 6, then the pers- if he's an, a- an anti-Trinitarian, will, not, will start to be very uncomfortable. <laughs> because the, it, this is a problem. Why is it that Jehovah's glory is the glory of Jesus according to John chapter 12? So in any case, we can see that the Bible is very clear that whenever they saw uh, Jehovah, they were seeing Jesus Christ, okay? That's the explicit teaching of the Apostle John. So no one's ever seen the Father, they were seeing Christ. 
So when you see the word Lord in the Old Testament, the name Jehovah, don't assume it's necessarily the Father rather than the Son or the Spirit or the one triune God. It could very well be the Father. It could just be the whole Godhead, the undivided Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. But many people assume that the Old Testament's about the Father, and the Father's the God of the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, the Son and the Spirit show up for the first time. So they're like late to the party. So the all fathers in the Old Testament, they finally show up in the New Testament. That isn't what the Bible teaches at all. That's, that's made up. It's not true. So, uh, but many people think that. They think the Father's the Old Testament God. He's angry and mean. And then in the New Testament, Jesus is nice. He shows up. Not true. That isn't what the Bible, how the Bible presents it. Now, the Old Testament sometimes speaks of someone called the messenger or angel of Jehovah. The word angel means messenger. That's all the word angel means. Now, there is a class of created beings who are God's messengers or his angels, okay? Uh, and the Bible never says that angels are cute with baby faces and you look and oh, look how cute they are. In fact, when people saw angels in the Old Testament, they typically scared. It was scary. Like, they weren't like, oh, look how cute that angel is. That's just a made up a thing from Catholic painting. So, um, but in any case, the word angel just means messenger. And both the Hebrew and Greek words for uh, angel or messenger are used for those who are not in that special heavenly class of messengers. So, for example, look at Genesis 32 and verse 3. Genesis 32 and verse 3. So here Jacob is coming back to um, the land of uh, Canaan. And Jacob sent, in Genesis 32, 3, it says, Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, uh, the country of Edom. That word messenger is the Hebrew word for angel. Now, did Jacob send heavenly angels or did he send human messengers? Well, obviously, he sent human messengers, okay? So the word angel simply means messenger. Jacob is sending messengers to Esau to let him know. And Jesus says, oh, great, I'm, I'm coming to see you and all these armed men with me. <laughs> oh, no, what's going to happen now? So he's sending messengers. The same word in Numbers 22.5 is used of messengers Balak sends to Balaam. So Numbers 22.5, King Balak sends angels to Balaam, messengers to aim. To, obviously, those are human servants of King Balak, not heavenly angels, heavenly messengers. Okay. In the New Testament, there's many more Old Testament examples. In the New Testament, when John the Baptist sent messengers from prison to Christ, saying, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? That's the New Testament word for angel. John the Baptist didn't send heavenly angels. He sent some of his disciples. He sent human messengers. So the word angel means messengers. There's many texts. And of course, there is. Sometimes it is used for that heavenly class of messengers, heavenly angels. But it's not only used that way. Now, why are we getting all, into all this? In the Old Testament, there's a very special messenger called the angel of Jehovah or the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Jehovah, the messenger of the Lord. And that is actually the pre-incarnate Christ. It's not one of the heavenly angels, and he's not just a human messenger, but Christ because in the New Testament, he would be sent from the Father into the world to become man. It was appropriate that he would be the one in the Old Testament who the Father would send to uh, appear to people and, and, and point forward to redemption and, and send the messengers. So in the Old Testament, the angel of Jehovah, the messenger of Jehovah, is the pre-incarnate Christ. And you can see that in quite a few texts that that is the case. So for example, like in Genesis 32, where Jacob saw Jehovah face to face and was it says, I saw God face to face, my life is preserved. Earlier in that passage, it says it was the angel of Jehovah who appeared to him. So the angel of Jehovah is, is God. Actually, even in Exodus 3, where Jehovah says his name is, I am that I am, it says it was the angel of Jehovah that was in the bush, the messenger of Jehovah. Okay? So that again, even in the burning bush, that was Christ. That was Christ who was speaking. So uh, the one who had permanently become man was the one who temporarily appeared and who was the messenger, the angel of Jehovah. I'm going to give you a long quote here from Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trypho. So who is Justin Martyr? Justin Martyr wrote Dialogue with Trypho around AD 140. Okay, so this is written about AD 140. It was the first writing of its kind that we know of that exists in early Christendom. Okay, so this is, 
He's, it's his dialogue with this Jewish guy, and he's proving Jesus is, is the divine Messiah in uh, the dialogue with Trypho the Jew, Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trypho the Jew. He's called martyr because he was martyred. Justin was killed for his faith. Now, in this dialogue with Trypho, Justin identifies Jesus Christ both as the messenger or angel of Jehovah and as Jehovah himself, as one who is both distinct from the Father, because if you're the messenger of Jehovah, you're distinct from the Father, and yet equal in nature to the Father one who is himself God. So this is a big quote, but I'm putting this in here just so you see that this idea that the angel of Jehovah is the pre-incarnate Christ, it isn't something that was made up in you know, 1952. This is in the earliest extant writing of this kind of discussion in early, uh, early Christendom. So longer quote, but we'll read the quote. And I continued, it is again written by Moses, my brethren, that he who is called God and appeared to the patriarchs is called both angel and Lord. So the God who appeared to the patriarchs is the messenger of Jehovah. The word of God, therefore, recorded by Moses when referring to Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, speaks thus. And it came to pass when the sheep conceived that I saw them with my eyes in the dream, and behold, the he-goats and the rams which leaped upon the sheep and she-goats were spotted with white and speckled and sprinkled with a dun color. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, Jacob, and I said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Lift up thine eyes and see that the he-goats and rams leaping on the sheep and she-goats are spotted with white, speckled, and sprinkled with a dun color. For I have seen what Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God who appeared to thee in Bethel. So the angel of Jehovah says, I am the God who appeared to thee in Bethel. And that is what the Old Testament says. It's the angel of Jehovah. And he says, I am uh, the God of Israel, the God of, who appeared in Bethel. Where thou anointest the pillar and vowest the vow unto me. Now therefore arise and get thee out of this land and depart to the land of thy birth and I shall be with thee. And again, in other words, speaking of, of the same Jacob, it thus says, and having risen up that night, he took the two wives and the two women servants and his 11 children and passed over the brook Jabbok. And he took them and went over the brook and sent over all his belongings. But Jacob was left behind alone and an angel wrestled with him until morning. And he saw that he is not prevailing against him. And he touched the broad part of his thigh, and the broad part of Jacob's thigh grew stiff while he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. But he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said to him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. For thou hast prevailed with God, and with men shall be powerful. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me thy name. But he said, Why dost thou ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, which means face of God. For I saw God face to face, and my soul rejoiced. So here again, uh, Justin Martyr says, the God who appeared was the angel of Jehovah, who is, is the true God, the Messiah. Uh, and I continued, moreover, I considered it necessary to repeat to you the words which narrate how he who is both angel and God and Lord, and who appeared as a man to Abraham, and who wrestled in human form with Jacob, was seen by him when he fled from his brother Esau. They are as follows. And Jacob went out from the well of the oath and went towards Charon. And he lighted on a spot and slept there, for the sun was set. And he gathered of the stones of the place and put them under his head. And he slept in that place. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, whose top reached to heaven. And the angels of God ascended and descended upon it. And the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham thy father, and of Isaac. Be not afraid. The land whereon thou hast, thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and shall be extended to the west and south and north and east, and in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. When I had spoken these words, I continued, permit me further to show you from the book of Exodus how this same one who is both angel and God and Lord and man, and who appeared in human form to Abraham and Isaac, appeared in a flame of fire from the bush and conversed with Moses. Have you perceived, sirs, that this very God whom Moses spoke speaks of as an angel that talked to him in the flame of fire declares to Moses that he is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob? I give you another testimony, my friends, said I from the scriptures, that God begat before all creatures a beginning who was a certain rational power proceeding from himself, who is called by the Holy Spirit, now the glory of the Lord, now the Son, again wisdom, again an angel, then God, and then Lord, and Logos, word, that's the term for word in John 1. In another occasion, he calls himself captain, 
It's John, Joshua 5, 13 to 15. When he appeared in a human form to Joshua, the son of Nawe, Joshua, the son of Nun. Just as we see also happening in the case of a fire, which is not lessened when it has kindled another, but remains the same, and that which has been kindled by it likewise appears to exist by itself, not diminishing that from which it was kindled, the word of wisdom, who is himself, this God, begotten of the Father of all things, in word and wisdom and power, and the glory of the begetter, will bear evidence to me when he speaks by Solomon. Now here he's saying Proverbs 8 is about Christ. God speaks in the creation of man with the very same design in the following words. Let us make man after our image and likeness. God converses with someone who is numerically distinct from himself and also a rational being. It is false to say that God spoke to angels or that the human frame was the workmanship of angels. So when God says, let us make man in our image, he's not talking to angels. We're not in the image of angels. But this offspring, which was truly brought forth from the Father, was with the Father before all the creatures, and the Father communed with him. Even as the scripture by Solomon has made clear, that he whom Solomon calls wisdom was begotten before all his creatures, and as offspring by God, who has also declared the same thing in the revelation made by Joshua, the son of Nun. Listen, therefore, to the following from the book of Joshua, that what I say may become manifest to you. It is this, and it came to pass when Joshua was near Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and sees a man standing over against him. And Joshua approached to him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said to him, I am captain of the Lord's hosts. Now have I come. And Joshua fell on his face to the ground, on the ground and said to him, Lord, what commandest thou thy servant? And the Lord's captain says to Joshua, Loose the shoes off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And Jericho was shut up and fortified, and no one went out of it. And the Lord said to Joshua, Behold, I give unto thine hand Jericho and its king and its mighty men. And speaking in other words, which also have been already quoted, here he's quoting Psalm 45 in Hebrews 1, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So here the Messiah again is called God in the Old Testament. A scepter of rectitude is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hate, hast hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hearken, O daughter, and behold, and incline thine ear, and forget thy people in the house of thy father, and the king shall desire thy beauty, because he is thy lord, and thou shalt worship him. Therefore these words testify explicitly that he is witnessed to by him who established these things, as deserving to be worshipped, as God and as Christ. So that was a long quote, it's from, that was chapters, from chapters 48 to 53 of Mar Justin Martyr's Dialogue with Trifo. But I'm just, I, I wanted to quote that because I'm just showing that this view that it was Jesus who was all through the Old Testament whenever they saw, this is actually the view of the very earliest documents of Christendom that we have that talk about this. And they're proving that Jesus is the divine Messiah to Jews using these facts. And you can still do that today. I took a um, brief course about on the Talmud when I was going to UC Berkeley. They have like this, this school for Jewish studies there. And there was this guy, this, this hippie rabbi who had a tie dye yarmulke. Okay, he was an interesting guy. Uh, but he wanted me to prove that Jesus was God from the, he said, this is, I, I believe this was an exact quote, but it's been a long time, okay? But he said something to the effect that the average Jewish rabbi knows the Bible as well as the average born-again Christian. That was his term. So that's, that's quite a compliment, actually. If the rabbis, or, or it also says something that the rabbis don't know the Bible very well because they study all their traditions instead. But uh, he wanted me to prove that Jesus was, the Messiah, was God from, from the Pentateuch, from the, from the books of Moses. And so I used some of these passages, and then he didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay, so, but it works. This is, this is, it's in there, all right? So we should agree with the early Christians and view Christ as the one who appeared every time anyone in the Old Testament saw Jehovah. All right, go back to the text of the study here. Obviously, if you're doing a Bible study list with somebody, you're probably not going to read a huge quote from Justin Martyr. Unless maybe he's had anti-Trinitarian influence, and then maybe you could share, share something like that. But you're, you're probably not going to. But I just want to share that with you so that you kind of know this is, this is a very ancient view. So finally, when the full, Galatians 4, 4, and 5. Galatians 4, 4, and 5. So all through the Old Testament, Christ appeared temporarily, prefiguring his permanent becoming man. <coughs> And of course, when it says in John 1 that Jesus, the word became flesh, the point isn't that he only took a body. 
Christ assumed a complete human nature, not just the body. He had a human soul, a human spirit. He was 100% human, just like us, except without sin. But flesh is emphasized to emphasize the lowliness, the condescension of what the eternal son assumed. Okay? Because this kind of emphasizes, if, if he if said, and the word became a human soul, well, that could sound maybe a little noble. Okay? But the word, the creator, became flesh, became a human baby, that's condescension, that's lowliness. Okay? So that's why flesh is mentioned in John 1 versus you know, just saying the word became man. That would still be you know, an immense humiliation, but the word flesh is used to emphasize the lowliness uh, of Christ assuming complete humanity. So Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So in the fullness of time, Christ came in to the world and united human nature to his divine person. If you go back to Matthew 1 and verse 23, Matthew 1, 23 is quoting Isaiah 7, 14 about the virgin birth, or virgin, virgin birth, yes, but really the, the, the great miracle is, you might, it might be better said the virgin conception of Christ, because Christ's birth, the, the time that the water broke and he came out of Mary, was perfectly normal. It was just like any other human birth. The miracle was actually the, the virgin conception. That was the miracle, virgin conception. Uh, now, the virgin birth was a wonderful thing, and, and, and there were shepherds there. There were no, you know, three kings of the Orient. <laughs> Those guys came about a year and a half later, okay, and they weren't still in the stable a year and a half later. If you're wondering, man, we're tired of staying in the stable for a year and a half, okay? But the, the miracle is actually the virgin conception, okay? I'm not, doesn't, if you want to say virgin birth, I mean, she was still a virgin, of course, because uh, Joseph didn't know her until after Jesus was born, and it was a virgin birth, but the miracle is virgin conception. So Matthew 1 and verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Emmanuel means God with us. Immanu is with us, and El is God, like Elohim is the plural. Most of the time the Old Testament says Elohim for God. Sometimes it has El, which is the singular. Okay, and so here the Messiah is called God, uh, El, with us, Immanu, with us uh, is God, God with us. So this is uh, who Christ is in the fullness of time he came. Now, uh, we're not going to read Isaiah, if you go to Isaiah 8 and verse 8, just to kind of see the progression here. So Isaiah 7, 14 predicts the virgin conception of the Messiah. Actually, you know what, go, go to Isaiah 7, 14 just for a second, so we'll... Give you a little context as we keep going through here. So um, here, normally, we aren't supposed to demand signs. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after sign. We have God's word. We don't need signs. But here, uh, God's prophet actually told the king that you can have a sign. He, he commands him to ask a sign. So if God, infallibly through his prophet, commands you to ask for a sign, then it's okay to ask for a sign. Okay. If he doesn't, then we don't seek for signs and wonders. But if God infallibly in his word, or through a prophet, you know, in the time when there's still this revelation coming, he says, ask a sign, then that's okay. You can ask for a sign. Now, actually, the king didn't want to ask for a sign because he wanted to trust in the Syrians instead of trusting in Jehovah. So if he asks for a sign, and then God does a miracle, well, that's the end of my plan to go to the Syrians now. I mean, now I have to listen to Jehovah. So he says very piously, uh, that he will not ask for a sign in here. He says uh, to King Ahaz, Ahaz who was a wicked king. So Isaiah says in, in Isaiah 7.10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. So think miracle. You want something in the depth to happen? You want something in the heavens to happen? You, you, you want a miracle? You can have a miracle. That, that was quite a claim. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Oh, he was so pious. Yes. I will not ask so I can keep trusting the Syrians. Um, and so now, in verse 13, Isaiah shifts from a sign just for Ahaz to a sign to the whole house of David. He says, and he said, Hear ye know, O house of David. So the sign is no longer just for King Ahaz. Now it's the house of David. Okay? Because Ahaz is worried that 
these enemies are going to come and you're going to kill him. That'll be the end of his, the Davidic line. But that's not going to happen. The Davidic line is going to continue until the virgin birth of the Messiah. So the way that the virgin uh, conception, virgin birth prophecy fits Ahaz is it's basically if there's going to be the virgin born Messiah in the future, well then your house is not going to get destroyed. The, the Davidic line will continue. So you don't need to trust the Syrians. You can trust Jehovah. He'll take care of you. That's how it fits the immediate context, the promise of the future virgin birth. So verse 13, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Notice you is plural. It's not thee, thou, thy. It's ye or you. So you, the house of David, is getting the sign. What is the sign? And this is a sign that's going to be a really big deal, comparable to, you know, something in the heavens above, death beneath, think miracle. What's the miracle? Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That's a miracle, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. And bear a son. And she'll call his name Emmanuel. Okay? And here Emmanuel again means God with us. So here the, the virgin born Messiah is going to be God with us from the house of David. Now if you go to chapter 8 in verse 8, notice in verse 8 and verse 8 he's talking about these enemies that are going to come into the land of, of Judah. And it says he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. So notice in verse 8, who does the land of, of Canaan belong to? Belongs to Emmanuel. So it's Emmanuel's land, as that hymn says. So he's God with us, the virgin-born Messiah in 714. The land of Canaan belongs to him in chapter 8 and verse 8. And then if you go through to chapter 9, in chapter 9 and verse 6, in verse 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Handel's Messiah, I have the verse in there. Hey, I like Handel's Messiah, it's really good. If you, if you ever heard Handel's Messiah, you should, you should listen to it. It's, really, it's a blessing. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom... To order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. So now the mighty God is El Gibor. So Emmanuel, Isaiah 714. So the Messiah is God with us, with the, the term for God El in 714, the term for God El in Isaiah 8, 8, Emmanuel. And in 9, 6, it's the mighty God is El Gibor, the mighty God. Mighty is Gibor, it's the term for mighty, God El. So the mighty God of Isaiah 9, 6 is Emmanuel of, 9, of 7, 14, Emmanuel of verse 8 and verse 8. So sometimes uh, commentators on Isaiah have called this section of Isaiah the book of Emmanuel. Then you move to Matthew 1, 23, and of course in Matthew 1, 23, he's God with us. And then go to Matthew 18. We'll just see how this develops through the book of Matthew. So, um, so we saw that development through Isaiah there. Uh, Emmanuel of 714 is the mighty God of Isaiah 96. It's quoted in Matthew 123, God with us. So how do we see God with us in the book of Matthew? Well, Matthew 18 and verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Christ is in the midst of his church. He's God with us. Okay? So the God with us of 123, Matthew 123, is in the midst of the church. Jesus is in the midst of the church. And then look at Matthew 28 and verse 20. What's Emmanuel going to do with this church till the end of the age? Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Emmanuel, God with us, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Christ, the omnipresent God, Emmanuel, God with us, is here with his people in the church and will be with them till the end of the world. That's the development of that through, through Matthew. So we're going to have to um, wrap up there. But it is an amazing thing that the eternal son united a human nature to himself. I mean, this is, this is incredible. When you read the Old Testament, read the Old Testament thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is all over the Old Testament. He's the one who it's pointing towards. So you can get glorious truth about Christ in the Old Testament. You should read the Old Testament thinking about Christ. And you should also be amazed that 
that this was God's eternal plan that Christ would become man and come into this world and unite human nature to his divine person, die for us, rise from the dead. This was God's eternal plan. And as you get to um, do evangelistic Bible studies with people, and you get to preach the gospel and share the gospel with people, you get to participate in spreading the glorious news about Emmanuel, God with us, to uh, the coming generation until Christ returns, and then you won't have the chance anymore. So we should take the chances we have now, shouldn't we? Yes, we should. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the truth here that we got to cover today. We thank you that uh, the eternal Son of God did appear in the Old Testament, that he was the one who the patriarchs saw. He was the one who Abraham talked to. He was the one who Joshua talked to. He was the one who Isaiah uh, encouraged Ahaz to trust in and the whole house of David to trust in, that he was the object of faith for the Old Testament saints and our object of faith now. And we pray that you would help us to honor and glorify the eternal Son of God, that we would rejoice in his humbling himself to unite human nature to his divine person, that we would give him the glory and honor he deserves, that we would proclaim his glorious name to the ends of the earth uh, until the time that he brings this age to an end. And then we get to see him uh, in person, in his, etern- his human nature that he'll have to all eternity, instead of just seeing him by faith in the word of God. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.